Okay, we are recording. We are live. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Opening remarks from Greg Roseanne. Greg? I, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg. I am the Chief Technology Officer here at Graduation Alliance. Um, we have spent the last 13 years or so developing uh, all sorts of different solutions to allow uh, us to teach uh, many thousands of kids, um, mostly high school age kids, um, uh, from a remote setting. And, and we're thrilled to be able to run these webinars and share with you guys a little bit of, uh, of our experience. I wanted to offer a couple of initial thoughts just because there was some interesting uh, discussion in the breakout room yesterday. Um, and it was related a lot to technology. Yesterday I talked a lot about a lot of different technology tools. And I think, you, you know, sometimes it's easy to get kind of deer caught in the headlights um, of there's so many different tools out there. And you know what? They're all cool. Some are better than others. Um, what I really want to encourage, and, and this is based on our own experience as well, is try to start out very carefully and slowly with just a couple of things. And I would suggest, if you can, um, go to your schools and find out your, your school IT department, what technologies they already offer and support. Then try to branch out to your school district, what technologies do they offer and support and then try to look out into the broader realm of all these different things that are out there. And, and once you get out into that realm, uh, if you get out into that realm, pick, pick one or two, um, practice with your colleagues. Hey, I'm gonna set up a Zoom meeting like this and I wanna try to get 30 people on it and I'm gonna practice what it means to mute people and, and do all those types of things. And just, just um, you know, try to stay as flexible as possible and not introduce too many technologies too quickly because, um, you know, you want to learn and get to be good at one or two versus, uh, you know, trying to, you know, have 15, which pretty well won't all talk to each other anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so we had a little, some good discussion on that yesterday and I just wanted to share that and uh, I will kick it back to Jeff and Amy and, uh, We'll get on with the webinar. Thanks. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Um, before I start the presentation, um, I'm going to let Amy uh, introduce herself. I'll introduce myself, and then we'll we'll get to the the presentation. But I want to keep this very uh, uh, human presence oriented and and uh, personable and uh, interactive. So, if you have questions, please, as you have been over the past couple of days, post them in our our chat room. As I said at the very end of this presentation, as we did yesterday, as Greg had mentioned, we'll have three total breakout rooms where we can have some um, audio conversations, one with curriculum, one with Greg on technology, and one with Deborah O'Brien on special ed. So Amy Defoe is one of our <laughs> uh, great colleagues, and I've had the pleasure of working with her for about four years. Yeah, she's our science teacher, and uh, really would like for you just to kind of say hello, Amy, and a little bit about yeah. yourself before we get started. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining today. I hope this is going to be um, informative for you guys and you could take away um, some good resources here. Um, I've been teaching online virtually for um, over seven years. And before that, I was in a brick and mortar teaching science for 12 years. Um, going off of what Greg said, I, that technology piece is huge. I know um, technology can definitely be very overwhelming and I really like that he hit that point of like you know start small pick and choose maybe one or two and and go with it and um, you know it, it's it's definitely a learning experience and there's lots of great things out there um, you just gotta try not to get overwhelmed because I know technology with me I'm kind of like okay I'm gonna try this and I like to take little steps at a time but I totally get that piece of technology just can get to be a little bit too much, but it is manageable. I can do it. You guys can do it. Um, yeah, I'll pass this back to Jeff. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy and Greg. I'll go ahead and share my screen. We'll start the presentation. And uh, can everybody uh, see my screen and hear my audio? We should be looking at a screen called uh, formative and summative assessments. So if you get a thumbs up or yes, or yes, yep. all right, thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, thank you, Amy. Uh, I really wanna keep this around, you know, Amy's experiences. Um, just a teeny bit about myself. Um, I've 
I was a special ed teacher eons ago, a language uh, arts teacher in high school eons ago as well. But most of my life has really been spent in working online um, as an instructional designer, working with teachers, instructors, and faculty, helping them move online, and then teaching online myself for uh, more years than I care to mention here. So um, really just want to keep this very focused on you, your experiences, and let you know that we're going to build on what you do great every day in the brick and mortar uh, classroom. Um, so introductions aside, I want to ask a big question here and hopefully we'll get a big response with all the folks, all the big brains we have on here on the chat. Why do, why do we assess learning? Think about that and it doesn't have to be a dissertation in the chat, just a quick little, you know, why do we as teachers, as instructors, as, edu as educators, why do we assess learning? And I'm going to try to practice a little digital wait time here in the synchronous environment. So Kelly to make sure that our teaching is effective. Absolutely. Uh, we, we as teachers wanna know if our efforts are actually being fruitful. <laughs> exactly. Um, Kelly, nail, absolutely. Yeah, how, how, can our, how can we adjust our instruction to be more effective, Amy? Um, we've got a lot of great answers coming in here. Is our teaching valid? Um, you know, if we've met our learning goals, absolutely. I think we're in the right tribe here, Amy. Okay, to inform instruction, to assess what students need, absolutely. So really great, I appreciate you jumping in, everyone jumping in, please awesome. continue. Um, Amy, and if you wanna jump in and share anything that's coming up, I'll, I'll just continue yeah. on and we'll, we'll quick, quickly get to the fun part, you know, with, with uh, Amy here in a second. Yeah. There is one comment, I like this, to ensure students are engaged, learning and improving. I like that. All right, so how do we assess learning online? That's like the bigger question. So I'm gonna practice some poor digital wait time and just kind of get into that um, because we're about six minutes in. I wanna get to the, the fun stuff with Amy as soon as possible. <laughs> so if I was to share some tips and tricks with some colleagues of mine, friends of mine, you know, teachers, colleagues that I've uh, taught with or work with, these are the things that I would do in sort of the quick elevator speech. You always, and none of this is gonna be an epiphany, but this is gonna set the foundation for this conversation as we think about doing it online. You should be definitely thinking learning, learning standards driven. Those keep us honest, okay? That's the easy part. We've got them, we design to them. You wanna use a variety of assessments um, for multiple learning opportunities, a mixture, a recipe, a balance. Um, you wanna apply your normal everyday brick and mortar student-centered orientation in your practice and your philosophy Balance is going to be an uber theme throughout this conversation. What kind of assessments, how many of each, how many points do I ascribe to them? Uh, what's that sort of secret sauce of assessment for your course? Um, and you want to make sure, as, as you, everyone on the call has, has shared, these are really laser focused on your standards and your learning objectives. Um, Deborah and Cecilia will be talking a little bit about backwards design later in the week, but you start with the end in mind. What assessment can measure to this standard and what's the learning objective. Two learning objectives, you want to use your Bloom's highly focused, aligned, laser focused action verbs. You create, discuss, design X, Y, and Z in terms of standards and content versus the sort of elusive, ambiguous, a student will understand or learn. And we'll get more into that here in a little bit. And ask yourself how you're going to gain evidence of student learning. You know, if you've got an objective and you can't measure it, then you need to re uh, really, really refine it. Uh, and don't get bogged down, as Greg said, on the technology. There's, there's, there's a glut of technology. There's so many choices. Simplicity is best. You can always experiment with things later on, but you want to be learning focused. Um, so when we talk about formative and summative assessment and the relationship between the two, um, we, we, uh, we want to look at it from the perspective of both teachers and students. Um, someone said they lost their audio. Um, can I get a thumbs up or a if everyone else is uh, hearing me right now, that might be an individual issue. Right yeah, now. I hear you. Okay, we'll continue on. Um, so what's the, what's the purpose of this assessment um, and what's the purpose for the different audience? So if we look at formative, you know, the more learning orientation, you know, um, as, as many of you had mentioned, um, it's for teachers to understand, is what they're doing effective? Um, can they teach responsively? Do they need to pivot or tact a little bit to be more responsive to how the students are receiving it or not? And when you're thinking about formative from the student's perspective, 
I, as the learner, I'm understanding what I'm doing and how I'm growing as a learner. Um, am I getting it? Am I building that sort of fundament, funda, uh, fundamental, fundamental knowledge in Amy's course as I apply to higher level assessments? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Um, how can I improve? Um, how am I do me, doing against the learning objectives? S uh, scroll on over to the summative assessment. You know, from a teacher's perspective, you know, the, the, the purpose is how have my students um, li lived up to those particular competencies and outcomes? Have they performed at that threshold of mastery or competence that I need for them to perform in my course? Students, um, if they've understand, if they've met to those outcomes, same thing, um, how, how their performance was in a, in, a, in a larger unit of instruction. And one thing that we'll also, you know, talk about a little bit about formative and summative assessment is there's definitely overlap between the two. Um, you know, when we look at examples, we'll see that as well. But you all nailed it on that first question that I threw out there. Um, it's really informing us as teachers, as students, is in this endeavor, in this learning community and what we're doing, is what we're doing effective? Are we growing? Are we learning? Are we um, leveling up in terms of um, our, our learning against learning objectives? Um, we'll go to the next slide here. Um, uh, so we talked a little bit about blooms. I'm not going to belabor this too much. But, you know, in terms of the complexity, um, the depth and the scope of different learning objectives and standards, we want to have a nice mix. So in Amy's Earth Science course that she'll show here in a moment, um, she has a lot of sort of lower level blooms, you know, um, define, recognize, understand, you know, as students are being exposed to a lot of these new abstract concepts in science. But then, but then she mixes in later on and she scaffolds the, her course into higher level um, critical thinking more authentic and applied assessments where she has them do, create, discuss. So she's given them the confidence with those lower level formative assessments and scaffolding them on up to perform at the higher level um, assessments in her course. That's the balance um, that, that, that I'm talking about and that we'll see some high quality examples of. Um, if this is not just something that we're gonna chat about in the abstract. You know, when we look at standards and evidence-based and research-based best practices in teaching, online and blended. Um, we, we are Quality Matters subscribers and we definitely apply in all that we do, whether it's course design, instructional design, and teacher facilitation, the best practices um, outlined in the Quality Matters uh, K-12 online and blended rubric. If you look at the center here in bold, um, there are multiple opportunities in your course to evaluate and measure learning progress through varied, frequent, um, formative assessments with timely feedback. Um, formative ass assessments tend to be um, point values tend to be lower. There's more of them. There's more opportunities for them. Sometimes they're not graded, but they're there to inform the learner on their progress so they can scaffold on and be confident as they perform at the higher level uh, critical thinking assessments in, in Amy's course or anybody's course. Um, some examples, um, and we'll get to Amy's here in a, in a quick moment here. Uh, so when we think about online, and we'll show some real examples here in a second, um, you know, formative and summative. Some of these can go back and forth. So, so formative, you may have a quick knowledge check. You might have designed that inside of Google um, Classrooms in, in, your, in Schoology, in Moodle, in Blackboard, in Canvas, whatever your school learning management system or learning hub, um, wherever that's at. You may do an asynchronous discussion um, that is graded uh, where students have to produce a, a plan, a paper, or, or some kind of project. Um, that kind of assessment could be summative as well if you were going to count it for the, the, the threshold of mastery for that particular standard or objective or set of standards. Um, when you're looking at formative online, uh, you may have a peer review where you in an English course have done a paper and there's a draft and I have, may look at Amy's paper and provide her based on the rubric some insights in term, terms of her performance before I hand it in to my teacher for uh, the final assessment. Um, you may have uh, multi-part assignments where there's different phases. You may do an authentic project proposal for an, a workplace application in a discussion, an asynchronous discussion, or you could do it synchronously via something like Zoom. You might do some role playing um, as well, um, an outline, a plan, a case study. Summative, it's a, it's, it's a bit more simple. Um, it's your end of your midterm, your end of course exams, your, your, uh, your finals. Uh, it could be even a portfolio, um, which, you know, which is something that represents the cumulative performance of that learner. Um, when you look in general, when you look at summative and formative, 
we tend to do more formative as we're scaffolding students, you know, where they're at to those higher level, you know, learning outcomes that we'd like to see. Um, and then we're ascribing less points because they're more numerous. And then summative, we, you know, we typically have more weight and more points because it's a final sort of evalu evaluation and assessment of their performance against a particular unit, course, um, or, or larger set of objectives. Um, so I'm going to pause there for one second before I get into the last slide of mine and just kind of go back to touchstones um, of things that uh, are familiar to us. So um, really quickly, uh, this is Amy's syllabus for Earth Science, okay? Um, we all have done syllabi, we all have them. So again, to remove some of the mystique and some of the, the, the strange and the newness of moving online and blended, you know, um, start with what you do already in your classroom. Um, you know, this is, this shouldn't be um, very, you know, odd, this should be, you know, very, you know, approachable, you know, start with your syllabus. What are your objectives? What are your units of instruction? Um, and then consider, all right, I'm going to put this in Google Classroom. I might have a synchronous session in Zoom. I might create a little lesson in SoftChalk with a auto-graded quiz that provides feedback to the um, different um, concepts that students are learning for the first time. So, so don't feel afraid that you can't get started because, because we're talking about the online modality versus the face-to-face -face modality. Um, there's a lot of things that we can generalize, and a lot, lot of strength that I think that you can apply from your years of experience teaching face-to-face -face online. Focus on your objectives and your standards, your syllabi and your courses that you, that you already do. Let me go back to uh, the presentation here. And Amy, I know that I blabbed on a lot and you're, you're more than welcome okay. to jump in during my part, as I know I probably will on your, yours. So um, last slide before I get to the fun stuff and you can uh, really hear some authentic real examples from what Amy does in her science courses in terms of formative and summative assessments. Don't forget your rubric. When, you know, when, I, when I began this conversation around begin with the end in mind, you've got a standard, you've got associated learning objectives. How are you going to assess that? And then when you figure that out, then you can worry about the treatments, your lessons, and the things that you might call together or create and put in, you know, a Google Classroom or an LMS. So start with the end in mind. Let your rubric be laser focused to those standards and those ob objectives. Make sure that your, your learning objective are, are action verbs. Um, there's a lot of Bloom's taxonomy action verb cheat sheets out there that many of you all use and we can share. Um, you want to make sure that you're being very cognizant of balance. You're not putting in an assessment in there if you already measured it. You know, in the online modality and blended, you, know, you wanna measure something to the level of uh, threshold that you feel confident um, that, that represents that evidence of student learning and move on. Um, and you wanna be strategic as you place and you scaffold these throughout the course. Again, I'll use Amy's example before I pass it on to her. In her earth science course, there's a lot, there's a lot of abstract new concepts that she's presenting to learners. And that can be scary. Um, and she's got to quickly build their level of confidence and then knowledge base before they can perform at the higher level, um, higher depth, uh, you know, standards and learning objectives. So I am going to pass it over to my friend and colleague, Amy Defoe, where she shows real examples from her science course. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So, um, you know, as we're thinking about moving to this virtual teaching online, I think Jeff gave some great examples about how we go about designing it and keeping it focused on what our learning goals are. So what I wanted to do is kind of take you guys through um, a unit that I built in the earth science course on the water cycle, I'll kind of show you how I started out, how I plug it in um, and how I do formal, uh, formative and summative assessments in there. So Jeff, if you want to move to the next slide there. So, uh, we touched about this research, Quality Matters. I went through the training, it was great. It, it really helped me gear my focus on what, what is important here? What do I need to continue to remember as I build my units and go through the courses with my students? And kind of three things I like to focus on is of course, it's always about that, that learning goal, that learning standard. What is our clear objective here? Um, anytime that we start a course, I always, you, you guys get this too, I'm sure you get, you know, a student's always going to ask, what do I need to know? Like, what am I, what's the test going to be at the end? And so I, it's really important to make sure that you have those objectives 
for yourself as you're building this unit in the course, but also for your students to have. And I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, engagement, and we're going to talk a little bit about teacher presence because I think it is so important when you move to this virtual classroom. Um, in that engagement, making it really personable to the students, making them um, see it as an important learning uh, goal. And also that variety, variety for multiple learners. We all learn differently. Our students all learn differently. We need to provide different opportunities in a variety of ways so that students can be engaged, be motivated, and also hit all of those different Bloom's taxonomy um, herbs. And go to the next slide. So let me show you guys what this kind of looks like. So starting again with those learning objectives. I put them there. They're, they're always in our lessons, always in our, um, in our course. So I always start, start with a course introduction. And in that course introduction, I give them all of our standards or what our learning, learning goals are for that course. So they see it up front and they can think about it from a starting point. Okay, and then at the ending point, okay, at the end of this unit, I'm gonna be able to, and you can go through. Um, same thing with each individual lesson. It's right in there, you know, today we're talking about the water cycle. In this lesson, I'm sure it's the same thing, you know, that you're used to doing if you write your objective up on, on your whiteboard or project it on your document cam. Same thing, each lesson has that in there, so it's very explicit to the students. Okay, at the end of this lesson, I will be able to, or you will be able to and you can list it out there. And then I touch on this again at the end of the unit when we get ready for that um, summative assessment and that final exam. You know, I put it in the final, like the study guide, and I say, hey, let's go back to, the, to our learning objectives. Use this as your study guide. Can you go through and answer? So it's, it's a very clear process from the starting point while we're going through it, what the purpose is of each individual lesson. And then we hit again at the end where we ask ourselves kind of in feedback, you know, did I meet these goals? Am I ready to show my understanding of them? We'll go to the next slide. Uh, creating engaging and meaningful lessons and activities that build from each other. Um, I think if a student is going from a brick and mortar and then they're, you know, at home working virtually, I think you can kind of get kind of stuck in your, a student can get kind of stuck in their mindset of, well, this doesn't matter. I, I get this a lot in science. Students will say, well, science doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to be a scientist. Um, they don't see the connection of this is happening. These are important things. You're seeing it in daily life. So my biggest goal, one of my biggest goals, sorry, is I'm always trying to show them why is this learning important to the student? How does it connect to their lives? Keep them motivated in it, keeping them connected. You know, they could be at home, life is happening. Um, we just gotta keep them clued in, keep them engaged, keep them motivated to keep going through this course, seeing that it is meaningful and purposeful to them. Um, so I like to start off, you know, we start with the, the smaller knowledge-based things. Like we start talking about, this is a unit on the water cycle. And, you know, I give them a text little lesson about, this is the water cycle, these are the steps to it. But I, I gotta do more, so I need to engage them more and I need to show them um, maybe things that they may, they've never seen before, make it more meaningful, make those connections. Uh, one tool that I use in my course is Flipgrid. And it's a free use, it's a free tool that you can use. It's very easy to use, Jeff got me, got me into using it. Um, and it's a great way I can make quick little videos and I can just upload them and then students can access these videos. And so this particular one is on the water cycle. And, um, you know, I thought it was a great day. It was snowing one day and I was like, you know what, we're talking about the water cycle. I'm going to go outside and I'm going to show my students snow. I'm going to make that connection. Um, maybe they've never seen snow before <laughs> and, and I want to plug it in. And I, in my video, you know, I question them. I give, I, I, I ask them questions about, you know, where does this fit into the water cycle? And then they can, in a flip grid, you can add discussion into that video right there. Also talking about formative assessments here, another great piece of technology um, is soft chalk. And soft chalk allows you to build lessons and you can embed so much in these lessons and they've got great um, different tools that you can use. You can make scrapbooks, um, this particular one, which is awesome um, for formative assessments is they've got 
polls and kind of check-ins that you can use and they're super simple and again talking about formative assessments they don't always have to be graded but we're looking for this kind of like this check-in at the end of the lesson you know does my student are they there do they have the learning goal and are they on target and we can do a quick little poll right here where i can ask a question and it's just a quick check-in um, like i said it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be graded but again we're looking to see that that student has made that connection and met that learning goal in a in a quick way so using these polls and check-ins soft chalk is great and i apologize amy i wanted to show <laughs> Folks, uh, the uh, one of your Flipgrid videos that you did, um, uh, you did this. Uh, you were in Bali. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to? And uh, just as an example, we won't watch the whole thing, but uh, it's an asynchronous <laughs> video tool that one can comment on, like a discussion, like an asynchronous threaded discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I believe you were talking about uh, pollution. And Water pollution. Yep. We'll play it just for a second. Hey guys, it's Amy coming to you again from Bali in Indonesia. What do you see? Let's talk about human environments. Okay. This is the beach, the ocean. Here we can see it's completely literally polluted with human waste. Human waste. Okay, I'll pause that one. And, and while we're here, I'll also show that you know you can also just use a simple technology um, in YouTube. Uh, Amy really impressed me where she was doing virtual lab videos in her kitchen. Um, I'll play that for a few minutes and let you speak to that. We'll get, quickly get back to the presentation. This okay. lesson is on the water cycle. My name is Amy Defoe. Today we're going to look at one of the steps in the water cycle. We're going to look at evaporation. Evaporation is the process of water going from a So I, I just wanted to show those two examples. We can okay. share the links afterwards and we'll... Yeah, we'll, yeah. Okay. And I'll come back um, and talk about... You'll see here how, um, how those were used. So we'll go to um, going to this, talking more about formative assessments and giving students choices. Um, we're still talking about here in the water cycle. So in this particular activity, as we built upon, okay, we got some basic knowledge, understanding of what the water cycle is, what our steps are, then we kind of move into that more higher level. And here is where I can give my students different choices. I will say, um, there was a little note in, this, in one of the slides earlier that talked about um, being very clear in your directions, uh, even more so, I know you have to do that in a brick and mortar, but even more so in your virtual, you have to like spell it out, be very clear in your directions and what it is that you want the students to do. Um, Cause sometimes they'll just look at it and they're kind of, they're probably, you know, in their, in their home and they can just kind of in their mind, they're thinking, okay do they mean this do they mean this is it okay to do this and then the questions start rolling and then they get kind of overwhelmed so keep it nice concise clear as to exactly what it is that you want um, and what their options are so you guys all know we all learn differently we're all motivated to do assignments differently i know sometimes you know if somebody tells me to write write a report um, I'm like, okay, yeah, great. I can do that because I like to research and I like to answer questions and I like, I'm very matter of the fact, science. But if somebody tells me to write a story and be creative, oh, I get all tensed up and that's, that, that's hard for me. But again, everybody is so completely different. So in this particular activity, let's follow the drop. Students got a choice, you know, they, we have the learning objective there. Um, they want to explain the steps to the water cycle and they could do it in the many different ways. They can create a presentation, you know, showing, using a multimedia tool of their choice, showing the steps of the water cycle. Mm -hmm. Or they can create a story and write a story about the journey of a drop of water through the water cycle. So again, providing different opportunities as you get up into those more uh, less activities that you're asking students to apply, showcase, um, and evaluate their learning. And we'll go to the next slide. And along with this comes the use of rubrics. Clearly it shows how their work will be evaluated and what is expected. So the student knows exactly what they need to do to hit meet standard or exceed standard. Um, also, it provides a great way for self-assessment. So as we're talking about these different types of formative assessments, this gives the student the ability to go in there and self-assess themselves. Are they on target? Are they meeting the goals? Do they need to improve? 
Um, so it's a great tool for a lot of the student to take a look at their own work and decide where they're at. It also is great for, you know, for teachers, for us, because it gives us consistent grading. We can go right through the rubric and there. Um, feedback. This is a, using that feedback piece uh, in the rubrics, thank you, sorry. Um, it's really helpful because this, you can, um, as you look at the rubric in there, you can click on the different sections of where they're at so a student can visually see where they're at. That helps guide their feedback. So it's not so like, oh, well, the teacher said that I just didn't answer number three correctly. But if you're using that rubric, you can see the category and you can see exactly, well, maybe you only explained, you know, three of the seven parts of the water cycle. And so giving that feedback becomes a whole lot more meaningful. I also like to include the learning objective in my feedback so the student can see, okay, here's my score. Um, the student, the teacher's giving me feedback and I can see where that feedback is going exactly towards that learning goal. So it makes that connection, making it clear and concise for the student as to what the expectation is. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these applications, some other online formative assessments. So as you guys saw, um, you saw a video in there I did. So as we move beyond just learning about the water cycle, we look at the impacts of water and we also look at how humans can impact our water. And so again, I plugged in another Flipgrid video. Again, I think this is important to show these, show students, you know, this is, this is real life. This is happening. Maybe um, you have never been to a beach where you've seen it polluted like this before, but here is your teacher physically on a beach. It's not in a textbook. It's not, you know, online. It's me, your teacher, showing that personal connection, that presence of this is real, this is happening. And then in that, in that video, again, I post questions to them. You know, what do you, what do you think um, is gonna happen? How does this affect, you know, our water supplies? How does it affect, you know, the different organisms that live here on our planet? And then I asked them to add in, I created a discussion where students can then post, you know, their beliefs and there's a rubric set around kind of giving some criteria about discussions, but it also asks the students to engage with each other. And so in the rubric for discussions, it'll ask the students to uh, reply to another student. So it's, it's kind of pushing them to get into that interaction piece a little bit more. Um, I also do a, an application on the next, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see, okay, do you think about your water conservation? Do you do anything? Should we be concerned about this? Are you concerned about it? And then I ask questions like, well, how do you use water in your daily life? And lots of times I'll get, I'll get questions from, or I'll get comments from people who are like, wow, I didn't know I used so much water. Or um, I kind of do a, a lot of things to help conserve water. Or they look at it and they're like, I think I could do more. So it's giving that then that application piece and a formative assessment, looking them to evaluate themselves. All right, um, awesome information, Amy. Um, I've been told we want to quickly get over to oh, the, sorry. Okay. the breakout rooms. It's my fault. Um, no, no. And uh, um, uh, if you want to quickly talk about the yes. virtual labs and we'll wrap yes. it up, we'll share the yes. breakout rooms here in a second. So again, talking about technology, smart small. There's lots of things that we can still do um, teaching online that you might think, well, I can't do that because I'm not in the classroom anymore. You know, for science more so with, with virtual labs, but I know this is also in other content areas that they've got great additions. Um, FETS is a good one where you can use interactives. It gives the, the students virtual simulations that they can go through. You can even do here like what I did where I modeled something. I created a lab, did it in my kitchen, because um, you know not everybody's gonna have the tools that they have. And then from there, I carry out, we go through each step of the science, the investigation, and then and we use that data to then, um, the students use that data to then conclude, uh, analyze the data and conclude it. So technology, things can still work. Um, and there's lots of great tools that are out there to help you get through that. All right. Um, and then real quickly, Amy, if you want to make a comment on here, we'll get to the breakout rooms. Yeah. So then you get to the summatives. Okay. So you've got now, you did your formatives. Here's your time to, did the student sum it up? 
did they hit, hit the learning objectives? And this usually comes in unit exams and final exams. Two things I wanted to point out about that, use a variety of different types of assessment questions. So let's not just keep it to like, you know, multiple choice over and over and again, but you can use, you know, you can do matching. Um, you can do short responses. So giving a variety of those assessment questions. Uh, and then make sure that your questions, again, going back to that backwards design, make sure that your questions are coming from that learning objective um, exactly from that. You know, I tell students again, what do I, they ask, what do I study for? Well, go back to, you know, go, go back to the course introduction, go back to those learning objectives. Can you answer those? Because that's where, you know, that's where this exam has come from, is from those learning objectives. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. I apologize. You know, typical fashion, I go over time. Um, um, uh, our illustrious teacher mentor, uh, Rachel McBain, is going to be um, posting the three web links to our three breakout rooms. Um, as I quickly talk over this finalization slide, because I feel it's important, even though we've gone a little late and I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, again, Greg Roseanne is gonna be hosting the tech room here, um, which is coming up here in the Zoom chat here. Here they are, thank you, Rachel. I am gonna be hosting the curriculum. We have some curriculum questions. We'll get into depth on those. Amy's gonna be joining Greg Roseanne. Um, and of course we have Deborah O'Brien, um, you know, talking about special education. Just a quick um, summary on what we talked about and we can get into it in curriculum. I want you all to be confident and draw on your own experiences from teaching in the brick and mortar modality. Um, draw on that, you know, it, we're just in a different medium. We're gonna learn some new things. We're gonna make some missteps, um, but you've got that experience. Let's use it. Um, draw on your, your colleagues. Technology, as Greg started off with the conversation today, is really there to serve you. There's so much you could just get bogged down. Pick something that's simple that you're familiar with, maybe and hopefully something that's supported at your, your district and school. Um, it should never be a technocentric kind of orientation. It's always focus on student and pedagogy. Let's use the technology in a smart way. If there's an auto grade feature in Soft Chalk, as Amy has shared, where you can offshore a lot of the lower level blooms um, measurements and you can focus on the teacher facilitated, then let's do that. Um, minimal time investment, and Amy can talk a little bit about some of those tools. Um, think of yourself as the facilitator of learning, um, the guide on the side, um, not the sage on the stage. Um, it's not a textbook or a teacher or a lecture centered model, it's a student centered model. Always be striving to create connections for your students. Um, foster relationships and always try to build that learning community. Yesterday we had a lot of questions around participation, engagement, reaching out. You always want to be fostering that just like we do in our face-to-face -face modality. So thank you all. We've got